Welcome to the show, Ben. Hello. Thank you. So can you give a brief introduction to who you are and what you do? So I am a nutritionist. Um, I focus on all areas of nutrition. I used to call myself a performance nutritionist. I kind of still do. Um mainly because I like to see people perform optimally. It's as simple as that, if I'm honest. Um, I got into the industry because I used to be obese, used to be really overweight, uh, and the kind of journey to get slim, to reclaim my health, having had IBS, ADHD, you know, uh, eczema, was profound. Um, and once I got slim and what I considered healthy, I left a career, uh, what was destined to be acting, um, I was a big, you know, I was a big actor. I spent ten years training as an actor. I just left it behind. I said, I've got to share my knowledge on nutrition. I think this can help a lot of people. And that was when I went and became a personal trainer and coach. Um, sort of evolved um, through being a personal trainer. Then realised that I wanted to teach and inspire on a bigger scale and started to move a lot of my work online, coach people online, started doing a lot of videos, started my own podcast and started to just see myself more um, as a coach that could inspire others and teach personal trainers how to potentially be better at their job. Um, and haven't looked back since, started sort of that kind of business and angle of mine in probably about 2009, 2010, um, you know, six, seven years later, got UK's number one rated podcast, you know, we've got lots of stuff going on and I just try and focus my time on educating and inspiring other people on their journeys now. And what was the initial catalyst for, for you wanting to change your lifestyle, going from the acting to going over to becoming a PT? Uh, it was... Purely because I'd left school, I was in, then in the big bad world all by myself, uh, lived a bit of a sheltered lifestyle uh, when I was younger and that I went to boarding school, um, had my life sort of hand fed to me a little bit but learned many amazing life lessons but I was in the big bad world and I was then you know, looking at my career and as an actor, for me, you want to be as slim, fit, healthy and high performing as possible and I wasn't. I was overweight, I didn't think I was physically attractive and I kind of looked at famous people in the acting world and I said, look, to be successful, I have to be like them. I'm not going to get as many parts being an overweight, jolly actor, it's not, it's not going to go down. So I said, right, to be successful in my career, I need to be fit, happy and healthy and that was just my mantra and I just started to go on a relentless mission to be healthy and you know to be lean. And to come back to that point you say of success and that mantra, do you think it's more people should focus on changing their mindset as opposed to changing just that physical appearance? I think it's both. I think it has to become hand in hand. You know, we can't get to a... The mind has to change with us. We can't get to a point where we're just relentlessly changing the body and seeking perfection because there is a dangerous side to the fitness industry where people are relentlessly pushing for, for perfection in however that looks. And we do have to evolve the mind to understand what it is that we want as people, what drives us. We have to learn how to love our body for how it is and that it will never be perfect. Like... People can look at me and go, well, he's not perfect, but what is perfect? Like, I'm happy, I'm lean, I'm healthy, um, I'm doing pretty good. You know, so it's, it's definitely both ways. And I think, you know, the biggest thing that most people struggle with is probably the mind and how to get over some of the blocking factors we have as people. And as soon as you really nail and harness the mind, you can do incredibly great things with your body, uh, with your career, with everything. And coming to back to that point that you raised with uh, having IBS and eczema, do you think it is a case of uh, people's nutrition that causes them to have those sorts of diseases? Yeah, definitely. Um, don't get me wrong, there is stress-induced side of this. So there is stress-induced IBS, which can be a big problem for a lot of people. So again, that comes back to the mindset and our perception of our environment, which is really key. But yeah, dietary, you know, my source was a dietary. So gluten and wheat were big triggers for me in my diet when I was younger. Uh, removed them, uh, went on a kind of a 
bit of a gut rehabilitation period where I was taking a lot of probiotics and some other nutrients that help repair the gut and the immune system. And then later on, uh, about 18 months later, I reintroduced gluten back into my diet. was absolutely fine. Dairy took a lot longer to fix. Dairy is something that I've actually only recently reintroduced into my diet. Um, and the reason why it took so long is because I, I was happy eating goat's dairy and never really thought to reintroduce cows. Um, so I've gone through that process with myself again now. But, you know, there's so many problems that we have with our nutrition that are a result of foods that are inflammatory to our body. And that's why I'm a big proponent of work out what these foods are. It could be anything. You know, I've got people around me that are intolerant to apples and they get an itchy back of the throat. Like we can be intolerant to everything. It's just about listening, responding, being honest with ourselves um, and finding little workarounds. And I think that's the scary part of removing foods from a lot of people's diets is they're like, oh, well, I can't eat that anymore. Well, bread's just really convenient. And, you know, you've got to accept that there's just some things that are going to react to people. And if you want to be in great, optimal health, then perhaps some things need to be removed, potentially long-term or potentially short-term, while you fix a problem. So by that you would mean probably it's a little bit of trial and error and everybody is very individualistic in terms of what they would have to take out of their diet. Definitely. Um, I just ask people to listen. If you're unsure, you know, keep a diet diary. Notice the pattern. Let's say you kept a diet diary and you get bloated uh, on Monday morning, Tuesday evening, Wednesday lunchtime, and Friday at breakfast. And then you can say, right, what did I eat in those meals? And you might go, well, interestingly, I had eggs in all of those meals. I might be intolerant to eggs. Let's remove eggs from my diet for a little bit, see how I feel, see if the symptoms go away. Then I know that there's a problem with eggs. I can potentially look to improve the integrity of my gut and the health of my gut, then bring the foods back in and see if the symptoms improve. Um, and if you don't or can't listen to your body or you're really struggling, it might be a case that you uh, remove some of the things that we know are quite commonly allergenic, like gluten, wheat, dairy, eggs, soy. You might remove them um, and then just kind of listen as you reintroduce those foods and just go from there. Um, yes, you can get tests, but I'm much, I'm a big fan of uh, elimination diets because it teaches people about how food makes them feel and creates that connection between the symptom and the food rather than getting a test through the post or your results through the post and it's saying, oh, by the way, you're intolerant to X. Please don't eat it. Well, it kind of put, puts more onus on, like you say, for the person to take responsibility for their own actions as well. If you can find the root cause yourself, you're more likely to take action to get rid of it because you can see, well... From doing, like you say, taking a diary, and you can see what causes the inflammation, you are best able to take action and change that, and be it short term or long term, make that change and take it out of your diet, as opposed to being reliant on, say, like you say, having a, having a test uh, and having somebody say to you, "Well, this is what you're you're allergic to." Exactly, um, and I think. The quicker we can take responsibility as people for our health and our destiny, really, um, the quicker we're going to have much more success. Like the amount of people that blame external factors, blame problems that we have. Like look, we've all got problems, like you know, in different shapes or forms. We've all got things that hold us back. But essentially, we need to stand up. We need to take action against our our, our own reality, and really. We can be our own success, and I think you know the modern media does a great job of painting a picture of what is perfect, which doesn't exist. Um, and we need to have resilience as people to be able to stand back from that and say, do you know what? Yeah, I get I'm working somewhere towards that, but I'm going to create my own version of perfection for myself. I'm going to try and strive to be the best person of myself. And really, we deserve that. Of ourselves because we all want to live our best life that's why I love talking about health fitness and nutrition because it's about living your best life if I can make people energized happy sleeping well fit then you live your best life you have a better career you have a better home life now everything is more positive 
you, you touched upon that point of obviously sleep. Uh, probably some people don't associate that with what effects it can have on your diet. Can you explain a little bit to the listeners how, what a great impact sleep can actually have? Well, we all know how we feel after a bad night's sleep, and I can imagine a lot of people might be listening to this going, yeah, God, I haven't had a good night's sleep in years. And you're right, like sleep affects the hormonal system, so over time we might get a change in our hormonal status, we might get a loss in libido, um, which is a sign that hormones are going downhill, both in males and females, so a loss of libido. Uh, a big thing in terms of the diet area is that a lack of sleep makes it very hard to control your um, hunger hormones, ghrelin and leptin, and this means that you might crave sugary foods, you, you feel like you're never quite eating enough because you've just got this lack of overall energy and obviously we associate a lot of the time energy with food. So it's very easy to overeat and overeat on sweet things when you're tired. Um, and you know, that's when people were reaching for caffeine too much, caffeine and a couple of biscuits. Um, so sleep, it just affects everything. Then you've got it from a training performance perspective, like you're never going to be able to train and push yourself as hard in the gym if you, you don't uh, sleep effectively, if you don't rest effectively. So it literally affects everything. So I say to people, look, what is the one thing that you can change? Sleep will positively affect everything. Training, fat loss, the way that you feel, your libido, quality of life, all of it. Well, like, like you say, it has a massive impact on virtually everything that we do, really, in terms of be it... Well, the, for some, the big one would be obviously the performance aspect, uh, but then over the grand scheme of things, it's going to affect everything in, in, your, in your lifestyle. So what are kind of some of the tips you would recommend to try and help somebody if they're having problems with sleep? Well, the first thing is you've got to make time for it. This is a big thing. No one's making time for sleep. Like People go to sleep when their TV program ends or, you know, they've finished doing something. The reality is most of us get up at the, the same time most days. You know, the alarm goes off at six, half six, whenever. And you've got to work back from that alarm time with an optimal sleep window. So if you know that you work really well on seven hours sleep, eight hours sleep, nine hours sleep, and you're getting up at six o'clock in the morning, then if you need eight hours sleep, you need to be in bed asleep by ten. And a lot of people are getting in bed by 10 and then they're sitting on their phones looking at Facebook or Instagram or some shit on the internet when really they know that they should be getting some good quality sleep. And this is where we just have to have uh, due diligence in our lifestyle and just switch off. Like I know that I work well if I'm asleep by around quarter past half past 10. So my phone goes off at 10, I'm in bed, I'm reading a bit of book, you know, chatting to my girlfriend, just chilling winding down my brain so I can get to sleep for quarter past half past ten and be refreshed and ready for the next day. So big thing is yeah, making time for it, making sure we're not having caffeine too late in the day, very important. To removing distractions, phones, iPads, TVs, all that kind of stuff. Um and yeah, they'd probably be my key factors if I'm honest. And also there's this myth of Having eight hours sleep, it would be probably something that do you agree with or disagree with in terms of, or is it more a case of everybody is very individualistic in terms of their sleeping pattern and it should... Well, people are individualistic, but that doesn't change the fact that most people are going to feel good on around seven, eight, nine hours sleep. I find for men, if they're not too active, seven hours sleep is good. For people that are quite active, seven, seven and a half, maybe eight hours sleep, women tend to do well on a bit more sleep, I find. Um, they're looking at like eight, eight and a half hours. Some people um, need up to nine. But I think for a lot of people, if you're getting sort of seven, eight hours sleep, you're probably pretty decent. Again, the more active you are, the more recovery that your body is trying to do. So your sleep is even more important from a physical and a mental level. Um so I think it's just playing over time and learning and observing how your body works best. 
but you know, there's not going to be huge variations in what is optimal from a sleep perspective. But I think eight hours is a good, good sort of aim for a lot of people. And kind of backtracking a little bit, and to bringing up the point that you raised about gluten and dairy, there's this massive trend nowadays, obviously, of people going, well, using free from products. What are some of the kind of downsides from a nutritional standpoint to go in that way? Well, if you're managing your nutrition effectively, there shouldn't be any deficiencies or any problems or anything by removing certain food groups. In terms of free from products, they're usually very nutrient devoid foods. So there's no point going, oh, I'm intolerant to wheat or gluten or something, and saying, right, I'm going to take out bread and pasta and all these foods, and I'm going to replace it with all these free-from foods, because it's still not an optimal form of nutrition. Eating loads of, you know, and a lot of these free-from products are really nutrient-devoid foods. They're using, you know, white rice flour, tapioca starch. You know, there's not a lot in it. So if there's now a diet with lots of free-from bread, pasta, you know, all sorts of stuff. That's still not great. We want to be eating lots of fruits and vegetables, lots of vegetable-based starches if possible, potatoes, brown rice, quinoa, different forms of potatoes, starches, carrots, etc. So, you know, I don't think there's any problem with removing foods. Just be intelligent to make sure your diet is still broad, varied and nutritious and don't rely on the free-from foods. Sure, have them now and again. Like we, you know, my girlfriend's gluten-free. We buy, um, like the pizza bases now and again, make a homemade pizza. But it's something that we do, you know, maybe every couple of weeks or once a month rather than, you know, multiple times mm-hmm. a week. And then I'm having nutrient-devoid cornflakes for breakfast and stuff. So, you know, it's, we've got to look at this in the, the in the larger context. And when you, you raise that point, obviously, of trying to not use gluten free for example over a long period of time what probably some people that well that don't have celiac disease and obviously that's a different story and altogether obviously they are have to go down that gluten free route because it's life or death it's a life or death situation but just for the normal person that, that believes that they've either got a an allergy to wheat or an intolerance to it and they perceive that they need to now go on to a gluten-free diet what is well it's what are some of the pitfalls to that and what do they not know because in some cases uh, it's either higher in sugar and salt in the product to make up for taste and then there's probably that misconception in in the in the consumer industry in terms of what the manufacturers actually do, because obviously they go, uh, well, there's programs obviously on BBC like Eat Well for Less, and they have like gluten free soup, and you're thinking, well, there'd never be gluten in a normal soup anyway. So that's just maybe it's better to educate the person, would you agree, as to, to, to kind of read the back of the packet to see what ingredients that, that product has? Well, as a coach, I'm obviously always trying to educate who I'm trying to teach but you know I'll be honest there needs to be a good improvement in people using common sense there's not enough people being just purely objective about the food that's going in their mouth why and the ingredients like if we're having to read packets that have got tons and tons of ingredients on it then we need to stand back and go okay I appreciate this isn't ideal how much is this in my diet well I'm only really having this 10 maybe 20 percent of the time then that's absolutely fine if we're reading so many packets that you know it's taken us two and a half hours to get around the supermarket then we've lost sight of what is a good and healthy diet because most people's diet should be full of you know nice healthy uh, lean proteins fruits and vegetables whole grains whole fat you know all that kind of stuff things that don't have a label so we have to be objective on what we are consuming and uh, the healthfulness of those foods. And then just, you know, exercising a little bit of common sense on certain food ingredients. But the chances are, if most of the diet is good, most of the diet is healthy, those small little amounts of 10, 20% of, we'll call them bad foods for the case of this argument, it's not going to have a big problem. 
like depending on what we believe in in terms of sweetness you know whether a spa team is really that bad and all the other ones if it's only in our diet a little bit i probably wouldn't be that worried about it if someone was consuming three four five cans of diet coke a day mm. i'm not really even that bothered about the aspartame i'm more bothered about the habit there of wanting to have that diet coke all the time needing that satiating sweet taste there's there's a bigger problem than just the sweetness and saying to someone oh you should do that the sweeteners are bad I want to bridge that from a, a mindset and a lifestyle perspective to see why that much of a processed food is in the diet and what that is kind of uh, accounting for. Because you know, a huge amount of people have emotional crutches to food, feel that they have needs to food. Like, I'll be honest, like if I'm really tired, I'll quite often have a couple of diet drinks during my day because I know my body is craving sweet foods. And the best thing that I could probably do is just have a diet drink to kind of get rid of that um, taste and that need that I have for something sweet, but not take on board loads of unnecessary calories in the form of sugar. So I think we could just do so much better being more objective and critical and exercising some common sense. So that's, that's probably the take home point from that would be it's fine. Well, finding the root cause of, the nutrition and like you say it's if it's 10 to 20 percent of your diet it's not the be all and end all it's kind of not making them a hab habit of like you say drinking coca-cola eat eating sweet things on a more regular basis so, so in terms of in terms of that ben you, you you say you have when you are struggling that bit sometimes uh, what would be some recommendations for other people? Because obviously that might not work for everybody. Sure. Um, so what you mean when people are tired? Yeah. Well, firstly, make sure you're trying to sleep as much as possible. Other things, um, obviously, caffeine is going to be something that people use a lot. A lot of people, when they are tired, don't really get much of a kick from caffeine because. People overconsume caffeine as a generalisation. It's in people's diets an awful lot. When we get up, when we get to work, uh, mid morning, after lunch, like there's a lot of caffeine. And the more caffeine you have in your diet, the less sensitive to, you are to it as a nutrient. So I have very little caffeine in my diet, which means when I do have it, it's pretty effective. It's very effective for me because um, it is a powerful ergogenic aid. It's a powerful stimulant. If you've got sweet tooth cravings. Um, and you don't want to take on board loads of unnecessary calories, I quite often recommend to people uh, to chew gum, have uh, licorice tea, maybe have some kind of uh, another kind of form of sweet mint, and then also to keep yourself busy. I think this is a really important thing. A lot of people end up eating a lot of um, bad food when they are just you know sitting around, they might be at home watching TV, a bit tired, a bit bored, and we tend to just eat. Just mindlessly eat. And I think when you're busy, when you're working towards stuff, you know, you're, you're just enjoying life and, um, yeah, being busy, then you don't think about food as much and you don't think about the cravings as much. That's, that's some very t helpful tips. And, and Is there any other things that you could associate from a nutritional side of things in terms of more on the performance side of things, where you could get maybe a little bit more performance gains? Well, for anyone to perform optimally, firstly, sleep, we've mentioned it, can't help you if you're not sleeping properly. After that, you've got to make sure you're eating enough. Simple energy equation, like if you want to be a high-performing athlete, you've got to make sure you're eating enough food, period. you then got to make sure, ideally, like consistent protein feedings throughout the day, so for someone that's very active, you're probably going to be eating a good serving of protein four, maybe five times a day, looking at spreading those meals out around four every four hours. And then eating enough carbohydrate, you know, uh, there's a bit of a culture still that low-carb diets are more effective than high-carb diets. Ultimately, we need to eat a, a carbohydrate load that suits our energy needs and suits the way that we feel. If you eat high-carb meals and it makes you feel good, it genuinely gives you good energy, um, good satiation from meals, then awesome, have a high-carb diet. If a low-carb diet makes you feel good, 
awesome. Eat a low-carb diet. Just make sure you're getting enough carbohydrates to support the energy that's going out and uh, quite often the glycolytic demanding exercise that you're doing and most people are doing glycolytically demanding exercise crossfit sport bodybuilding classes that kind of stuff is all glycolytically demanding um, so they would be my my top things from a performance perspective then make sure your timing and uh, being disciplined with your caffeine intake then you can look at a couple of key ergogenic aids um I always recommend a website called examine.com if you want to look at um, good sources of ergogenic aids that are research proven uh, in the right doses. Um, like we, I own a supplement company and we always refer people to examine. They're like, look, if you don't know about supplements, just go and learn Like to make sure that you're not wasting your money on things that don't work. So I think with those couple of tips, a lot of people could actually go a long way. Okay, well, that's that, that's very that's very useful because obviously, in terms of supplements and the supplement industry, it's uh, virtually a minefield in terms of. Well, if we just touch on the point the point of uh, protein shakes, there's probably hundreds, if not thousands, of different choices you could pick, and in terms of, uh, without delving in too deep in that subject, uh, it's a case of, what is actually in that product. In all reality, without obviously sticking your head in the in the back of the packaging and reading every ingredient and doing that that for every single product to to find out what the best uh, course of protein is for you. So, like you say, we're bringing up that website is probably a better tool and source for people to kind of get more knowledgeable about what are good sources of protein and what product would be best for their goals. Yeah, I mean, protein for me is simple. It's just, it should be just protein and a couple of added ingredients. Like a whey protein shake, for example, should be probably around 80% protein per 100 grams for a lot of people. Um, if you're reading the ingredients label, unless it's some kind of all-in-one and you want an all-in-one purposeful drink uh, that's got recovery benefits, might have sugar in it, creatine, etc., really a whey protein should be protein, um, some form of emulsifier, some form of flavoring, some form of thickener like guava gum, um, and really that's going to be it, really. Um, as soon as a company starts putting in loads of different funky ingredients, um, you, yeah, you then maybe want to stand back and go, well, you know, why are all those ingredients in there and uh, are they in there? And this is where we need to understand ingredients. Like you might look at guava gum and go, oh, God, I don't know what that is. That sounds a bit weird. Well, that's perfectly normal ingredients, a perfectly normal thickener that's in absolutely bazillions of different mm. foods. So I don't think, and it's like e-numbers, we sometimes look at e-numbers and go, oh my God, it's an e-number, it's going to melt my brain. There's loads of natural ingredients that are classed as e-numbers. So again, it's just an education process, like Google it, have a little search on examine.com. Um, so by all means, be objective, but don't always be alarmed because you know there is a lot of good companies doing good ethical things in the supplement and food based world and to, to probably finish on this last one in terms of protein what are the different sources of whey that you could get and to kind of make my point what would the general public be better in having because there's a, uh, was it whey isolate whey concentrate and the other one escape, escapes me there's hydrolysate and then there will be casein as well. Um, what What is best, I think for most people and their needs, uh, probably concentrate or a blend of concentrate and isolate. There's not really any benefit to having one that's sort of faster acting for the majority of people. It's going to be very rare that someone would benefit from like a hydrolysate, for example. And it's very expensive and it's hard to flavor because it's a very acidic mm -hmm. um, form of whey protein. It's a bit sour, so it's very hard for companies to flavor it effectively. Um, like, for example, us at Awesome Supplements, we just use a concentrate because it has a, a thicker taste has a thicker mouthfeel and it's easier to cook with and you know whey protein's handy to be able to cook with it as well you know chuck it into some recipes maybe throw it into some porridge that kind of stuff um, so yeah I just think concentrate and the nice thing is is concentrate tends to be cheaper um, 
because it's undergone less processing. So everyone loves a bargain. <laughs> so I think we'll wrap it up there, Ben. So my final point it, uh, to take away is if anybody wanted to get in contact with you specifically, uh, what would be the best form of way for them to do that and what would be in terms of social media? Well, uh, I'm all over the internet, everywhere. I'm a bit of a social media slut. I'm always putting uh, information out there into the ether. So if people um, Google or search my name in any social media platform, Ben Coomber, C-O-O-M-B-E-R, they will find me, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, YouTube. Um, the biggest resource I have for free learning is my podcast, which is the number one rated in the UK. That's Ben Coomber Radio. We've done over 232 hours of free learning now, um, nearly four years into the show. So that's probably good for a lot of people. You know, you can visit my website, bencoomber.com, loads of free ebooks there, loads of resources. Um, if people did want to learn about supplements that work and don't, by all means, check out examine.com that we've talked about. Um, our company is awesomesupplements.co.uk. Uh, and then from an education perspective, we have bodytypenutrition.co.uk, uh, which educates um, both the general public and personal trainers in uh, nutrition. So we've got a very wide-scoped blog on there. And again, a lot of other resources, books that I've written on nutrition and training and cooking and stuff like that. So there is lots of stuff out there. So once again, Ben, thanks a lot for taking the time out of your busy day. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. And hopefully people have had some value from the show. And for everybody else, this podcast will be aired every Thursday. So until next week, I will see you then.